Now, you look at history, at all the people that have been killed in the name of religion, it is a motivating force. It gives people who want to do evil the justification for what they do. Introducing yourself for the mic. Uh, hey, I am Dondi Bunya, uh, lead guitarist of Brimstone and Fire. So, we're sitting in Demiurge Digital Studios, which is the site of maybe three earlier podcasts. In two or three, three or four, three or four, quite a few uh, mm -hmm. podcasts over the years, and. Uh, this is the 20th installment of the Dreams of Consciousness podcast, so I wanted to do something a little bit special, and I think the very first real interview I did was with you guys back in 2012, something like that. Yeah. So I, I figured uh, this would be a nice alpha and omega sort of thing, the sort of two-year anniversary of the podcast, and uh, you know, you guys have a, your first album coming out, mm -hmm. so good way to tie everything in together. Let's... Start with you, Dondi. Yeah. How did you get started? <laughs> what was what was life like before Brimstone and Fire? Uh, because you're you're one of the few guys who I refer to as scene OGs. Like before there was there was an actual death metal scene when there's just you know maybe a, a handful of bands yeah, you were yeah. you guys were playing back then um, doing shows and yeah us and a couple corner. of other bands yeah and we're talking 
early 90s, right? You guys formed around 92? O officially, yeah, 92. Brimstone and Fire is from around that time. But unofficially, we've been making noise since around late 89, early 90. Uh, how did you get into this music? Because I, I know from growing up here that this wasn't easy music to find. It was almost sort of like you had to be lucky enough to know somebody who already knew about it. Right. And um, Well, for me, it was a lot easier getting into uh, death metal because I was already into metal. I had some uncles who were uh, like the sort of local version of hippies, but uh, they had um, loads of LPs from the classic rock era and some from the late 70s, early 80s uh, hard rock and heavy metal genre. So, Are we even, talking like Sabbath, Rainbow, stuff Sabbath, like Sabbath, Rainbow, Purple. Uh, I had, had a couple of uncles who liked Maiden, one who hated it, then all of them hated the first wave of thrash that came out of the Bay Area, and they said that when they when they, were able, when they saw a picture of them on the back of the LPs, they said, "Man, are these guys gay or something?" Because <laughs> when you look at them, <laughs> they, they do look a little bit, uh, no, and they're from San Francisco. So, <laughs> well, definitely the drummer was the question. <laughs> <but>. um, <laughs> so, uh, and one thing that I do need to point out for listeners uh, from overseas is it, it wasn't just hard to get this music because of the location uh, it was also hard because of martial law like certain music yes. wasn't allowed in yes and it was only like maybe around like 86 80 whenever the revolution was that yeah around uh 86 87 they eased up a little yeah. yeah and so a lot of this kind of music was actually banned under the marcos regime when did you st first start hearing like slayer and metallica and like that that kind of thrash stuff? Uh, i first heard uh rain and blood uh two years after it was released so that was around 89 okay yeah and were you already playing guitar at that point yeah i, I was making noise i couldn't wouldn't really call it playing guitar and more like uh, annoying the neighbors how old were you 11 12, yeah. That's pretty young, dude, to be playing... Uh... Playing noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I, actually, I was trying to, to be a quote-unquote hard rock guitar player. <laughs> well, I, at the time, I already heard metal and I already liked it. I didn't think of myself as uh, a metal guy. Not really. Uh, did you have friends that you could jam with? Uh, no. Um, that's the thing. Uh, maybe we can talk about it later, but that's how we got the band together. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, was Brimstone your first band? Yes. Oh, wow. And when did you guys put that together? Um, Mike and Lloyd had the idea around uh, April 1990, I think. April 1990. And they pulled you in? Yeah. Uh, a day or two later. They already had the whole thing planned out, and this was before most of us had the instruments to play. And the, those of us who did have instruments to play were kind of terrible at it. <laughs> One thing that you were always very specific about, because I always used to ask you about the, um, I guess, the origins of the scene here. Yeah. And it's from the basis. Really. Yeah. I exactly. It, what was, I, I guess, just uh, just fill me in on that. Like, what form did that take place? Was it army guys who were, were playing on the um, downtime? Or? Well, as you know, uh, most, most of our... I, I guess we, sh we should explain what the bases were. Uh, the uh, American bases here, the, the naval base and the air base, but more from the air base, the, the one in Clark. Angeles, yeah. in Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to a lesser extent, the, the naval base in Subic also, but uh, mo most of the music came in through Clark. Okay. So, um, as you know, I was saying, um, most of our local musicians here, uh, they have to make a living, right? So they don't usually play their own tunes. They just have uh, what's what used to be called the 60-40 mixing, 60% um, standards and 40% uh, of the new stuff, whatever's popular. Um, those guys, uh, that generation of bands, uh, the money was coming in through the bases and the peripheral areas where they had the little clubs and all that sort of thing. Around the late 70s, they, they started playing hard rock in these, these places. So um, By request? Or was it just... Uh... I, I'm not too clear on how it started, okay. that they started playing uh, hard rock at the places, but more or less... But you can imagine, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, young, one, young yeah. army guys, yeah. like, they're probably into, like, hard rock more than... Right, so, so yeah. as, soon as, as soon as they found out that there were people paying to listen to this stuff, 
uh, of course, the bands who need to make a living. They started in, and uh, you know, getting together the songs that they need to get into these clubs to play it to make a living. Um, one of those bands was Capitan Bacal, I think they were called, uh, Captain Steel, really. So uh, they played a lot of uh, Iron Maiden covers. That's that's one of the reasons why Maiden is still highly regarded here, because of that cover band. Because of that cover band, that, wow. uh, that they were the guys who spread the word, so to speak. That this, there's this sort of music, and it's quote unquote cool, and you can make a living at playing it. Back then, <laughs> not today. <laughs> it, do you know how they found out about this music, or was it just like? Showing up at a club and people that, would yell out thing. Maiden. That's the thing that I am not Play some on. fucking Maiden! Maybe. Could, <laughs> could have happened that way. Um, but however it did happen, um, as soon as they got a toehold in, into these clubs where they could play these songs, that, that's all it really needed for, for this thing to take off. Uh, all, all of a sudden, everybody who had... To, it's really economics, I think. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody who had to make a living in these places knew that if they wanted to to, to get in, this is what you had to play, mm -hmm. or at least uh, a significant portion of your set list should include this sort of music. That's an incredible irony that you know, for at least a, a short, short period, period of time, time you can yeah, make a living. Playing exactly. Metal. If you wanted to make a living, you had to play metal. Right. That's great. So, if if we're talking like, you know, the period of time that that. Uh, the bands were playing these basses before you guys started playing uh, late 70s to, to early 80s yeah. to early 80s uh, when did the music start getting heavier and heavier like was it was it concurrent with what was happening overseas or was it was there like a lag of a couple of years I, I, I suspect it was a uh, more of the latter maybe 18 months I guess that's still pretty fast considering like probably back then, if you ordered a no, well, because um, you, you're familiar with this. When when you've got relatives overseas and they've right. got new stuff and they right. bring it over, so you know they they want to brag a little and say, "Hey, I got this new stuff." And so that's one of the things that uh, prov provided the push to get the music out there. Okay. Yeah. For you specifically, when was the first time you heard, I guess, quote unquote, death metal? Death metal. Uh, Nineteen ninety. Okay. Yeah. So almost, I mean... A couple of months after I heard uh, Slayer, I, okay. I heard some death metal. I think it was Possessed. So almost as, like, Roadrunner and... Uh, yeah, and when, when those guys were coming out. Eric, like, Eric were Loads repeating. and loads yeah, yeah, of stuff, yeah. 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 Was it again through relatives, or...? Not really. Um, the, you... the, earlier, the earlier forms of hard rock and heavy metal, I got that through my uncles and some of my cousins. But death metal was mine, so I, I went through that by myself. Were you tape trading? Uh, a little bit. There weren't really that many people to trade with at the, at the time, and when you did trade, you'd either get really crappy third, fourth generation dubs off of tape machines that you, you really don't want to know how they got the, the thing to run. Um, there were also the, the sources. I, I really should call them pirates, but uh, you know... <laughs> I used to buy from them too. Haha, <laughs> mea culpa. I'll just name the locations. There were in Cash and Carry. There were the places near uh, University of Santo Tomas. There were two spots behind Rizal Stadium. Uh, there were really skate shops, but they had some of the tunes. You could go there, and I'd actually bunk off a ROTC and go there. And, you know, that's how I failed ROTC. <laughs> <laughs> I was there before they opened. <laughs> Do you do you remember what? I mean, I'm assuming if it's '90, then was there any death or carcass or anything like oh, yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Well, the hot item that was being traded around then were live bootlegs of death. Oh, okay. Yeah, you could get those in the skate shops that I was talking about. You could get those. And almost as this was happening, you guys were were putting together your uh, yeah, crimson fire. We're yeah. making noises in that direction. Yeah. Although I should point out, in in the interest of um, historical accuracy, punk rock and hardcore have always had a strong presence in the quote-unquote Philippine underground. And these these guys, they had their own sources. They weren't dependent on uh, like rich relatives coming over here, bringing stuff over. They, they, they had their own pipeline. So that martial law did not interrupt punk and hardcore here in the Philippines. 
So that's something I envy with those guys. You know? They had that. We sort of kind of tagged along. When they sometimes they they bring in metal tapes, but you know it uh, it wasn't something you could count on. When you say they have their own sources, uh, was it just so? below the radar that the authorities had no idea how to stop it or didn't know it existed? It was below the radar until uh, until they shut down this there was this there was this one bunch of guys who were broadcasting out of a van <laughs> yeah they, they had like the, that old C, you know remember the old CDs that they had here yeah yeah, yeah. yeah they had one of those they, they'd patch in like a tape recorder or something into it and broadcast off of that and, and those guys got stopped wow that's uh I want to make that movie. <laughs> um, I wonder if they're still alive, though. <laughs> oh, really? You think uh, they may be? They may be gone. Oh, you know, uh, unfortunate. Moving quickly on. <laughs> um, death metal is fun. Real death, not so much. Mm.
So okay, it's it's half halfway through 1990. You guys are. I'm assuming the other guys in the band were also hearing the same stuff you were. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you're hearing this music that's new and fairly you know, very obscure at the time, mm -hmm. um, and probably completely incomprehensible to everyone around you. Um, what was the appeal? To us? Yeah. Well, uh, speaking only for myself, I I liked how how the bands would uh, arrange their their music. It wasn't the usual hard rock formula. While I do like hard rock and I, I still listen to it a lot, uh, it, it was something... You, you couldn't rely on a formula. Yeah, th this was the first time I'd actually heard anything outside of jazz or classical that required you to actually engage everything that you had in your head to make this this noise this um, I don't know what to call it uh, this thing you, you couldn't 
you couldn't uh, get like prefabricated parts and put it together. If you did, you'd sound like shit. Mm -hmm. But if you actually had something, no matter how shit your chops were, if you had had a, a genuine idea of how you wanted to to construct these tunes, you could. That was the appeal to me. It, it was a uh, I don't know creative outlet, maybe. Okay, I, I my mean, neighbors would disagree though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, well, I mean, the way you're describing it is is really interesting to me, just because it. So much of what Brimstone and Fire became was almost exactly that. It was it's this this strange amorphous thing that's really hard to categorize, and there's a real intellect to it, and it's almost driven by its intellect more it is than you know like all the uh, the visceral aspects of metal, you know, which are easy to mm -hmm. to to get hooked on. You know, yeah, Brimstone some is, parts. Yeah, yeah a you couple do. of songs. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think like Brimstone, you know, not to rely on terms like progressive or technical or anything like that. Brimstone is above all like a very transgressive transgressive intellectual <laughs> um, it, it's a very thoughtful mm -hmm. sort of exercise in metal um, and it's interesting that even back then because if I'm being honest like what what appealed to me about death metal when I first heard it was it was very fast mm -hmm. and it was only after maybe six to you know 18 months of listening to the same album over and over again like realizing this is incredibly hard music to play mm -hmm. like it's not just some dude like playing right. the E string as, as fast as he can um, but you uh, you tuned into that very quickly. You guys did. Did you have goals when you first started? No, not really. I suppose later on we did, but uh, in the very early days, we just we just wanted to play. We just wanted to, you know. I mean, you guys were barely even teenagers when you first started, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm sure everybody understands. I can't really articulate it uh, in a way that would make sense to somebody who's who hasn't experienced it. But everybody. Who writes music has a uh, it's more than an emotional connection more than an intellectual connection it, it's something else that engages you entirely um, for whatever it was that that did this for us when we were listening to the music and later when we were playing the music was the main the main lure for us to, to keep going at it because it engaged us in a way that nothing else ever did. It requires you to go through go through your back catalog of uh, of thoughts, your memories, uh, everything that is you to you know to to use a Tagalog word uh, kal kal to to um, to dig through it and then find what works, rearrange it in a way that makes sense at least to you, and then bring it out. There's something about that. That uh, it's more rediscovery than discovery. Uh, that part of it, when you find it and then you bring it out, that's that's something else. It's it's everybody who's who's done this knows what I'm talking about. Most of the bands that form start by playing covers. Uh, we did too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what were you guys playing? Uh, all sorts of embarrassing things. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the least embarrassing ones were, of course. Uh, the the thrash metal covers we did okay. so, so so Slayer, Anthrax, Metallica, Megadeth, you know, we tried to play Testament, but it was beyond our abilities at the time. Really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> How soon were you guys writing your own uh, your own material? Two years into it. Okay. About. That's pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, considering how, how young you guys were. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we were strange little boys. <laughs> <laughs> what was the impetus? Because I, you know. I remember going to high school here, the people who wrote, or the people who performed really good covers were almost more respected than, um, right. yeah, the people who wrote their own songs, and, you know, if it was a weird style of music, people would be like, well, why don't you just play Nirvana, you know what I mean? What was the impetus to, to write your own music? That, that, that bit that engages the, okay. the, the, whole, the whole thing. Okay. Um, well, for me, anyway, I, I don't know about the other guys, you, you'll have to talk to them about that. Okay. Um... Was there any reaction to you guys uh, uh, switching to writing your own music? Uh, not really, because uh, the places that we were playing, everybody was starting to write their own material. So uh, we had a sympathetic crowd to play to. Okay. Uh, um, I suppose if we had uh, an unsympathetic crowd to play to, I don't know, it might have turned out something different. Uh, 
what was the crowd like? Was it an extended group of friends, or was there no, like no, a uh, ju- just uh, people with common interests? Okay, because uh, like uh, like death after birth, mm-hmm. uh, we guys, those guys and us weren't friends until after we started playing the same gigs over and over again. But um, when when you can recognize uh, kindred spirit and you're playing the same things, you have the, more or less, if not the same ideas, you you have uh, you have related ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that was a big help in the early days when you started writing because you said you could say to yourself, "Yeah, you know, uh, if I write this, I'm not the only one listening to it. I can share it to somebody else and say, you know, here, here, have, have a listen to this, and then." Maybe you could trade. If they had their own stuff, you could listen to that. So it sounds like by 92, 93, there was a fairly, uh, if not big, then the growing scene here mm. with a few bands playing and, and quite a, Quite a lot, actually. We had, there was at one point, uh, this, this was 93, I think, um, sometimes there would be more bands playing that were, than were on the bill. Okay. They they just show up with their instruments and they were friends of the bands they were playing, friends of the organizers, and of course in the culture here you can't say no to anybody, so everybody would end up playing these really long gigs until the cops would show up and stop them. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and would the cops show up just because it went on so late, or were there other reasons? It depends. Uh, some some of the gigs that we went to that got canceled were because they had no permit, so that was the fault of the organizers. The other ones. Uh, went on too long. Okay. Okay. But it's not like uh, Malaysia where the government is... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, that, that was over and done with by 86. Nobody was okay. coming over to shut you down because you had a, you had something to say. Who were the organizers? Was it mostly guys who were also in bands? or? Uh, yeah, Okay. mostly. Uh, sometimes it would be like uh, for quote-unquote fundraisers, but uh, most, most of the time it would be guys in bands. You, know, you, you can't get into some of the clubs, so they do their own thing. This this was the time of uh, what I called the uh, guerrilla gigs. They'd be organized under the radar. They'd talk to somebody who was affiliated with whatever local government unit they were talking to and then pay a little bit under the table. And then you can have a basketball court for the evening. You could play there. Or sometimes, sometimes if they were sympathetic, you could play in the municipal halls. Okay. Sometimes. It's like uh, uh, Malcolm X's, um, if they don't allow you in their restaurant, just form your own restaurant. Right. Just make your own restaurant. Yeah. Pretty much. DIY. When did you do your first recording? Uh, in, a, in a proper studio. Just anything? Like it, if you had demos early on or... Oh, yeah. We, <laughs> one cassette recording of uh, those early days survives. Oh, really? But I locked it away in the vault where it can do nobody any harm. <laughs> <laughs> it's that awful. How uh, <laughs> how did you record it? Did you guys have a four track or? Um, at the very first instance that we thought of recording it, we had this old uh, XY stereo mic. Okay. We plugged it into uh, a stereo component and recorded off of that. So you get the whole room ring and everything. It's it's awful. Well, we we didn't know any better. So how hard was it to get uh, gear back then? Was it good diff- gear? Yeah, I mean the kind that that you would need or. If if your folks were cool, you could easily get your gear. But oh, if, if they weren't, uh, you know, you'd have to either uh, convince somebody to lend it to you for the day, and you can rehearse on that. And, but then you'll have to return it uh, right, right, right. in the evening. Was there a lot of that going on? That's a lot of it going on now. <laughs> yeah. So so unless you ha- actually had the finances on your at that time, and th- remember this was in the early '90s, all of the bands that at that time that we're talking about are mostly my age 12, 13, 14 okay. no money of their own so right, right. unless you had somebody who could get you the gear you're up shit creek that is a uh, something that I hadn't uh, hadn't considered like I guess uh, I was under the impression that while you guys were playing these shows you were you know in your late teens early 20s but you guys were so young that like I don't yeah. think you could early teens mid teens yeah. yeah like I don't think uh, legally you guys could could actually get into bars, right? Uh, we couldn't. So it's almost like, like the DC hardcore scene where they're too young to actually play their own shows, and right. so they had to they had to form their own network. Uh, on that on that note, um, some of the old uh, punk and hardcore guys had their own thing going, and 
if they wanted to play a gig, they could play a gig. Mm -hmm. They could just find all the people they needed to find to to get the permits that they needed, and they played there sometimes. Remember, this was at the time when they 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 weren't taking metal seriously, right? Right. So we we were like the 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 poor cousin. So we sometimes <laughs> uh, get invited to play these hard punk and hardcore gigs when they felt like inviting us to play along, and so, so we we kind of owe them that. Mm. Be because uh, not all the places that we wanted to play would let us play there and some of the places that were available for us to play in came with all sorts of conditions right uh, were the conditions uh, musical or lyrical? Bribes, really oh really yeah. okay so it wasn't like um, a few of the the punk venues that uh, that I've been to and even Rumapi and KL mm -hmm. Uh, they're very strict about lyrical content. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want anything that has any kind of a racist message or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but that's not the, the conditions these guys were talking about, right? Mm, not really. Okay. Uh, the, the conditions over here were really more monetary than anything. <laughs> because I, ideologically, nobody gave a shit what you wanted to say really? at the time. Okay. Uh, af after, after the nightmare of martial law, everybody was saying, oh, whoa, whoa, we don't want to mess with people saying shit. And if they want to say that, Leave them alone. We don't yeah. want we don't want the heat on us. But now you know it's turned it around, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Like after um, uh, such a long period after censorship, people are starting to censor themselves. They're trying to censor each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
First proper recording was the recording of the skeptic single that was for uh, air submission to the radio station. So we did that in this little project studio. They only had four tracks. So you had two two tracks dedicated as stereo overheads for the drums and the bass guitar and the primary rhythm guitar on the first pass. This was before digital editing was available here. So um, if, you, if you fucked up, you did it all over again. Yeah. And you guys were recording all at once? The drums, the bass guitar, and the primary rhythm guitar all went on the first pass on the overdub. They'd bounce the tracks first. So those four, four tracks would get bounced on one of the, the tracks that had already been recorded on, and that freed up three more tracks to do the lead guitar, the second rhythm guitar, and the vocals. Okay. What year was this? Uh, 93, nine, 93, I think. So this is still pretty early on. Yeah. Like, you guys had only been playing for about, like, three, four years. 93, I'm, I'm trying to... Because I was listening to LA 105.9 at that point, and I, it was kind of a revelation that... I, it it con- coincided when I started getting into, into heavy and heavy music, so it was almost like, oh my god, there's a radio station that's not playing Weezer and Nirvana, but they're playing, like, Sepultura and stuff like that. Was that a big... Again, to use the word... Impetus, but I mean to have like an actual avenue um, to play your music. It gave us something to shoot for. Yeah. Uh, because up until then we were doing it mostly for ourselves. Right. Like, and then when we realized there were more of us listening, and not just the bands that we were already playing with and th- those small crowds, we were thinking, yeah, we could get this out. Yeah. Uh, it, it was, I guess, uh, a prod, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, why only Skeptic? Was it a budget thing? or When we had Skeptic ready for uh, submission, it was the only one that we were already happy with. I see. Uh, we were already working on several other songs. Yeah, yeah. It, it was the only one that we were really happy with, that we felt we, we, we wouldn't be embarrassed letting other people listening to this. Yeah. 
What happened with the Skeptic single? Did they actually end up playing it? Yeah, they did. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I didn't play it long, though. Maybe a couple of months. Did you get any reaction from that? Or any response? Um, from the other bands, yeah. But uh, from like uh, regular listeners of the radio station or the radio station themselves, no, not really. People weren't calling in to request Brimstone of Fire? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate. Uh, so you essentially just recorded the song for the radio station, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we'd already been working on these things before. Right, right, so, right. But in terms but, of the but this, physical format. The physical format, uh, yeah. The having su- Suddenly having that avenue to play these things mm-hmm. for a larger audience prodded us into just scraping the cash together and uh, putting in the time in the studio. And you were still teenager, teenagers at that point, so mm-hmm. it wasn't like there was a lot of money to go around. Not really. Yeah. Um, th- did anybody offer you the chance to record like a longer full length or anything like that? This was the bait that they put on the hook for uh, Kabila. Okay. Um, talk was then at the time that if the, the compila- compilation did well, each of the 10 bands on it, the company would pony up the cash to produce full lengths for each of them. Okay. That was, that's what was the idea anyway. That, w- that was what they offered us. But that thing bombed, really. Only the, the only people who have it are the bands themselves, friends of the bands, and then friends of the friends of the bands. It's not exactly... Uh, it, did, it didn't make as large a splash as either the, the labels or the bands thought it would. So let's talk about this compilation. Um, based on the bands that were around, like who, who was the label who decided to... Um, Tone Def was a sub-label of Ivory Records Philippines. I suspect they formed Tone Def only to root around the sofa to get some loose change. That's what I think. Okay. So... Were they releasing anything besides metal? A lot of OPM. Uh, Ivory, I, Ivory was a mainstream uh, recording. But I mean, OPM at the time was very much like love songs. Yeah, and, pop, yeah, yeah, yeah. ballads. Yeah. Were you suspicious at all that this... Uh, <laughs> This, this I, was... I had no say in it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they were just, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was through either Micah or Noel that we got invited to play on this thing, and we said, "Hey, why, why the hell not? Might, might turn out to be all right. Well, let's give it a chance." We said. Yeah. I'm still a bit pissed. Uh, they didn't send the engineer to to the gigs, so that he could have a. Uh, listen to what the bands actually sound like live because what what eventually ended up on the compilation it's haphazard uh, production wise this this is also partly the band's fault because we all at, at that age you're, you think every idea you got at is fucking gold you're, so you're you're telling the producer and engineer their business and saying no no you mix it like this and blah 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 and you know and then we have the result right Scott Burns doesn't pr- doesn't <laughs> like the drums like that. It, it's kind of funny because the timing also roughly coincides with when, you know, Columbia, the subsidiary of Sony, somehow got into their head that they could release like Napalm Death and Entombed and yeah. you know Morbid Angel on, on major on a major label. Um, yeah, you know. And I think there is a similar ignorance to what this music actually is and who listens to it. Mm-hmm. That is, in retrospect, sort of funny. Like. Funny from our side, I think, because death metal, death metal survived yeah. more than, than the labels. Like, the labels were left with, you know, like, how many, how many Boltor albums are you going to sell, like, through uh, your Columbia House, uh, you know, little thing? It, do you know how many copies uh, they produced? Did they really... Um, uh, on paper, they said they had 10,000 copies, although okay. I doubt that very much. Okay. And, I mean, just based on... For a while, we were getting uh, receipts... Okay. Uh, at least Brimstone and Fire was. We 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 got. Uh, well, they're not exactly spreadsheets, but there were there were the sales figures measured against the column where we 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 got a advance on the royalties. So, okay. so we, we did get paid, definitely, but uh, I I don't think they they make their money back. Okay. Yeah. I mean, ten thousand back in. 93 seems 93, yeah. yeah seems incredibly optimistic when even entombed I think never sold more than like 70,000 that's what they oh. said I don't <laughs> know if they actually printed that many yeah okay so heading into 
the mid '90s, uh, you guys have been. You guys had a couple songs on the radio. Um, mm -hmm. and you had this compilation. Were you guys established at that point? H had you been sort of? Yeah. Yeah. Let's put it this way: if you ask somebody if they knew about us mm -hmm. uh, in certain areas, they did. When was your next release? Because I know the um, a few months after Kabila. Uh, that's when we recorded, well, not recorded really, we, we just remastered the thing and gave it to the record company. The, that single of Skeptic, we gave it to them. So yeah. that, it had been already on the air for a while and then before it got actually printed on, on tape. Okay. So they released it as a cassette single? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, Filipino, yeah, it was a cassette. The, the compilation was on cassette. The, the, uh, um... Filipino Alternative Collection. Right, okay. Yeah. That was a compilation with other bands. Yeah. Um, I think there were only two other two other metal bands on it. Most of it was like uh, the, the 90s indie alt thing. So, okay. Th that was it. I've heard the version of War in My Thoughts um, from the old compilation, and I'm familiar with like the version that you guys play now. Mm -hmm. And... The song itself hasn't changed much, but it's like the way you play it has changed. Yeah, is that uh, fair? Yes, that's that's pretty very accurate. Because um, when the band the band went on hiatus in '96. Okay. Right. So between '96 and 2004, when we all got back together, uh, we'd we'd all been doing our own thing. So, I mean, even before we got got the, the band together the first time. We all had uh, disparate in influences. Some of us listened to uh, hard rock, jazz, goth, synth pop, industrial in my case, uh, and a lot of other things that you really wouldn't expect uh, guys in metal bands to be listening to. So when, when the band went on break, we all pursued all these different uh, avenues of expression. And we, when we got back together again, we brought that along with us. So that's why the new versions of the old songs sound the way they do. Okay. The the core ideas uh, are unchanged, but we've acquired uh, an expanded musical vocabulary. So we had new words to say what we used to say before with yelling and swearing. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> Oliver, my madness will not die. Is it murderer though I 
estates, piles of bones by monuments, a string of skulls about my neck, are all the ornaments that I need, for deep within my empty soul, the faces stare back at me. Thank you.
to misplace the key. Forever you trace each step that you're making. On a map of the world as you'd like it to be. As much pain inside your cage as outside. Your walls will keep you safe and found. Until you start to self-rely. There's no escape from this.
What was the, the reason behind the, the hiatus? <laughs> Inter- interpersonal conflict in the band, of course. Okay. Yeah. What made you d- guys decide to come back together? As opposed um, to maybe, I don't know, forming a new band or... Well, around 2004, I, and this thing had already been in the back of my mind for a long time. Uh, we had all these songs that we had stopped messing with because we we were at the age when, that's like I said before, you think every idea you got is fucking gold. And there were three guys in the band like that, me, Mike, and Ada, and we eventually got on each other's nerves. So uh, first I fired Ada, and then I quit. <laughs> And then for a while, for a while, Mike uh, tried to keep the band going. But then he, after a while, he said, "You know, shell this and then do his own thing." Were you also doing your own thing? Uh, I had been in two other metal bands before that, but I didn't have the same feeling. Um, Warts and all, Grimstone and Fire was something else. At that time, it was something else for me. It was one of the best times of my life. But. Uh, that being said, the, the stress of uh, the, str- and the interpersonal stress got to me. So, uh, and then '96, I said, "Fuck this! I got other things to do." But uh, in the eight years between then and 2004, it had always been at the back of my mind that we had this unfinished work. We have to, we have to get this done, you know. Otherwise, it's going to poison everything else we do musically until we get this out of the way. So, originally, in, in 2004, I, I wasn't really thinking of uh, reconstituting the band. I just really wanted that document right. uh, for, for myself. Okay. So, uh, yeah. How many songs are we talking? We actually had enough for uh, an EP at the time. Okay. So, some of those songs uh, have been filtered through the eight intervening years. Some of them made it onto outside. Okay. You said that uh, your primary interest in getting the band back together was to uh, to finish up the the old material. Mm. Um, I wanted to uh, take down the Christmas lights. Yeah. Right. Um, at one point, did you did you decide to also start writing new material? Um, at first, we we had this uh, dead end slash false start with uh, session musicians. Well, they didn't know they were going to be session musicians, so <laughs> that's why. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> they, they didn't read their contracts carefully? No, they thought they were going to have creative input. <laughs> and when they tried to change one of their riffs, I said, no, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> After I got rid of those guys, uh, it was just me and Christian. who I, I, I played with Christian before in two other bands. So uh, I said, listen, man, I need a bass player. I can't do this, this stuff myself. I, if I do it, it's going to sound like shit. So I told him, you come on over, you do the session thing for this, and we'll record it. We'll use, use the DAW, put it in, and then edit it. We'll have the document, and that'll be that. Uh, after, I think, a few months of work on this, Micah heard that we, were, we, were, we had this project underway and said, hey, you know, let's, let's finish this thing. Uh, during this time, it morphed from just getting the the stuff onto tape to to actually writing new material. Because even the stuff, the old old material that we were getting onto tape, we were filtering through the ideas that we've accumulated in the eight intervening years. So, all I said, all we need now is a singer, or, or at least somebody to grunt and yell over this stuff, and then we can maybe get the band together, play a, a few more times, and then that'll be that. Yeah. Okay, Famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 2012, I met you guys for the first time, meaning you, Micah, mm-hmm. uh, Christian, and then we did that interview near the palace. Right. And you did the uh, the live recording, and you did a tour soon after that. Uh, a week after. Yeah. yeah. Um, and since then, you've been relatively quiet, right? Mm-hmm. You played me some demo stuff. Maybe a couple years ago, 2013. Yeah. Does that sound right? Mm-hmm. Um, at uh, one of the shows that you played, Th- that was the the first. That was before the first hard drive meltdown. Okay. Yeah, so and so the stuff that you played me back then was essentially uh, what became the stuff on outside. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about outside. This is mostly old brimstone and fire stuff, right? That people haven't heard. Yeah, uh, mostly old stuff with a couple of. More than a couple of new songs, but uh, um, the best way I suppose to describe it is the 
the core ideas with uh, new words to say them. Okay. And this is the first full-length Brimstone of Fire album. And the last. And the last, yeah. So how long have... How long have you been working on this? I mean, the songs themselves are... Old. Old, old, yeah. old. But in terms of the recording... In- including Hard Drive Meltdowns, two years. Okay. This should have been out two years ago, actually. Okay. Um, and at this point, the songs are mostly mastered, right? You're just waiting for... Yeah, I just have to put them through the, the limiter, and then, okay. then I'm sending it over to the plant. Okay. And what's the plan? Uh... You're releasing it on CD and... CD first, and then for wider distribution, we're going to go uh, maybe Bandcamp or SoundCloud, something similar. All these years later, how do you feel about... Uh, uh, how do you feel about the songs and how do you feel about this release? Is it a relief? Is it a... Yeah, a relief. Yeah. Ask me again when, when's the thing's out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, when will it be out for general re- release? Are you looking at... Well, uh, depending on how soon the replication plant can move on it. I, I hope by July it's done. And after this, uh, you're just putting Brimstone and Fire, uh, Brimstone and fire to rest? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have to move on to uh, something else. I mean, I can't keep telling the same story over and over and over, you know. I mean, as much as I like it. And you, you can tell I like the sound of my own voice. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have anything planned? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you once we've got the, the stuff uh, all hashed out. Okay. Once we've got something for you to listen to. Okay. So you're writing music mm-hmm. with people I may uh, may recognize. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. As soon as we've got the the discs on hand, uh, you could either contact me directly. We'll try. To, we'll mail them out to you. Okay. We'll, we'll make us as cheap as possible. You know. So. It'll be out of my hair soon. Very then cool. also, we may be reserving a few copies for distro to some some friends who have distros. Ian, do you nope. have anything you want to say? Nope, I'm good. I've said way too much <laughs> like in the whole course of this, you know, of your 20, of your 20 episode <laughs> reign. 20 long episodes. <laughs> it, is, it is a little bit embarrassing that it took me, what, three and a half years to get to 20 episodes. Um, just not a not a great indication of my work rate, but in my defense, these Malaysian kids have nothing to say. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I guess that's it. Thank you. As long as they got something to play. Yeah. Well, that's also questionable. <laughs> and on that note, thank you guys. All right, man.
Babylonian punk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was into that before before the Babylonians were. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you more cred. Ahura Mazda punk rock.